authorities, uh, members of Academia Europea, members of ALEA, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear Helga. There are different reasons for me to say that it is a great honor to give this laudatio to Professor Helga Novotny on the occasion of delivering her the gold medal of Academia Europea. Let me mention just three reasons why I am so proud of it. One is because of her gigantic figure in the science scenario in Europe for the last decades. The second is for her impressive scholarly contribution in sociology, or should I say sociology of science, or maybe science and technology. And thirdly, because she is a friend of mine. Let me start by saying that uh, when I was asked to write um, this, laudet, this laudatio, I felt uh, some insecurity in the form of, will I choose the right highlights, uh, or will I forget something essential? And many other doubts that, that, that came to my mind. In consequence, I asked for help. The result of my request was overwhelming, and I highlight the contributions from uh, coming from Professor Thomas Koenig from Vienna and Professor Marich van der Wende from Utrecht. I have borrowed some of their ideas and I thank them for their help. I will not try to summarize Helga's curriculum vitae. I will rather say something about her scholar merits and about her, as I have said, gigantic figure in science policy in Europe. I have been told that Helga returned to Austria in the late 60s and despite her stellar publication record among many other uh, merits, she had to jump over several hurdles before, uh, including discrimination actually, before she was appointed professor at the University of Vienna. From, then, uh, from, from there, uh, she was uh, later appointed professor at the University of uh, Zurich, uh, where she engaged herself in a number of projects, such as the Branco Vice Fellowship Program, to mention, to mention just one. Helga has been a driving force in discovering existing uh, and exciting insights into how science is organized and how new knowledge stemming from science and technology is impacting our lives. Many of us in this room will remember the book with Gibbons and others, The New Production of Knowledge in 1994, that launched a wake-up call to the academic community regarding the fact that it had lost the monopoly on scientific research. She opened new pathways for thinking, conceptualizing, and developing research practice. Her work in this area has been essential in stimulating universities and to work across the boundaries of disciplines and those between science and society. You may remember that scientists and policymakers, including myself, would talk about mode one and mode two as if we knew what we were talking about. The essential theme of her most recent book the cunning of uncertainty also confronts universities with important challenges for education. All in all, she has been instrumental in reconnecting the natural sciences with the social science and, and the humanities. In other words, she has made great achievements in stimulating groundbreaking interdisciplinary research in, respons in response to the grand, ch grand challenges of our time. She I have been also told, is an excellent mentor, encourages students to develop a free and critical academic spirit to question and overthrow accepted dogmas for the purpose of making this world a better place. At the risk of making a mistake, I would believe that her involvement in the European Science Foundation in the 80s and 90s was an important milestone in her career. She became chair of the Social Science Committee of ESF by appointment through an independent search committee. And she jokes about it by saying that it was a fast track course in learning how to chair a group on the spot. 
we know now that it worked out very well, Helga. I have not forgotten that uh, she was as well founding member of Euroscience. Let me turn to the European Research Advisory Board, EURAP, in where Helga can be seen as one of the key players in establishing a truly European science scene. Europe is seen as some, by some as the first and probably the only really relevant advisory body on research and science policy to the European Commission. When she was chair of Europe, she brought into full sight for the first time her great skills to operate in a complex political environment. I had the privilege myself to be a member of Europe and of its bureau under Helga's leadership. She did a great, great job. This brings me to Helga leadership at the European Research Council. As a founding member of its, of its scientific council, she took an important role in shaping this unique instrument that has done so much good to our common goal, establishing and promoting science in Europe. There are lots of stories that could be told about the time of Helga as president of uh, the Scientific Council of the European Research Council. Some of them can be read in a recent book by Thomas Koenig that I recommend you to read. Her work at Europe turned out to be crucial in setting up the European Research Council. She actually asked two Europe members to intervene with the two key governments who were reluctant to endorse ERC. You may call that a hidden science diplomacy. I believe that it is now well recognized that Helga managed to steer the ERC through the bureaucratic maze in a splendid manner. Helga's role as president of ERC has inspired many men and women as an exemplary type of leadership with female persistence and calm and wisdom, she succeeded in bringing European research funding at globally competitive level. These achievements have been noted around the globe and Helga is now advising important scientific organizations in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Helga is proud, she tells me, that her Academia Europea membership number is 166. This means that she is one of the early members of our institution. Academia Europea is, in turn, proud of you, Helga. I have tried to give some reasons for our proudness and for delivering you the gold medal of the Academia Europea. Thank you very much. Helga will now receive the gold medal and of course for us as Academia Europea we are really delighted to have you here and uh, I think the Laudatio speaks for itself. Helga, congratulations and this is the moment where I would like to hand over the medal to you. And this is also the moment for the picture. With the medal comes the certificate and the Academia Europea pen. So please, Helga, do us the favor to accept this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I would like to invite Helga to present the medal lecture with the title The Resilience of Science. I would like to thank Siert and Enric and everyone else who has been involved in this very moving ceremony and I accept the gold medal with great, great pleasure and honor. Thank you very much. The topic of my lecture is the resilience of science and the good news is that science is resilient. But before I take you through the main reasons, the main arguments I have for making this claim, 
I would like to say a few words about the term resilience that has become very popular recently. There are many scientific meetings devoted to the topic of resilience, and there are reasons for this. Resilience is understood as the capacity to resist stress, unexpected disturbances, being better able to respond to or to mitigate um, pressures that come up in an unpredictable way, holding things together when under pressure and the like. But resilience is first and foremost a scientific term. It has been around in ecology for a long time. Bas Holling, among others, made, uh, wrote a very famous paper in 1973 on resilience. Um, which he understood as a system being able to function as a whole, even if, part, if some of the parts um, have become dysfunctional. And also in engineering and in some technical areas, resilience has been around as a technical concept to keep a system functioning uh, in this sense. But what happens very often when a scientific term is transferred to society when it's used in a general way. There are some risks that come with it. And the risks are what I would like to call a kind of normative naivete or normative blindness. We assume that resilience is good per se. And we forget that resilience can also be in the social world something we don't like so much. And uh, if you go back to the Greek mythology, <clears throat> there were these stories about monsters whose heads were cut off, and yet <clears throat> the monster had the ability to regrow the head. And in today's world, there are systems and individuals um, where uh, resilience certainly is not to be used only in the positive sense. So let me now turn to um, the three reasons why I think <clears throat> um, the resilience of science is such a, a, an important uh, topic. And some of my predecessing speakers have already mentioned the kind of feeling that many of us in the scientific community have had in the recent months of science being under threat. Uh, fake news, <clears throat> alternative facts, the denigration of experts have uh, surprised us, but we have somehow gotten used that this is the world in which we live now. But if we take a more distanced and sober view to this, we have to realize that fake news are nothing new. I have a friend, a historian, who is working on the archives of the cancellarias of the Medici and other Renaissance courts in Italy. And he's reconstructing uh, on the basis of documents how fake news were systematically produced in these chancellors, uh, in, the, in the offices of the chancellors, as part of the way to do politics. And <clears throat> also with regard to scientific facts, as much as we feel offended by what we see, the denial of scientific facts. We should also remind ourselves that scientific facts <clears throat> are the result of a process and of an ongoing process where new facts can replace old facts. And a long time ago, namely in 1935, Ludwig Fleck, an immunologist who was later, a Polish immunologist who was later sent to a concentration camp and died in Israel, wrote this wonderful book, The Genesis um, <clears throat> of a Scientific Fact. And the topic was the discovery of the pathogen causing syphilis. And this is for me the kind of Bible, how scientific facts become made. And I think when we speak about facts, we also have the duty to communicate to the public how scientific facts are made. The time in which we live, <clears throat> and therefore I think the attacks that many of us feel on science, 
I see them more as a collateral damage. We are part of the elites, and when the elites are under attack, science is under attack. Collateral damages can still be very, very bad. And <clears throat> we live in a time that many of us um, feel are darkening times, like the ghosts of the past coming back to haunt us, the ghosts of the 1930s, when the unity of science movement, to name but one, was an attempt on the part of scientists to stem the growing tide of the rise of Nazism, fascism, and totalitarian regimes, and where many of the scientists of Europe had to flee Europe, or those who were unable to flee were murdered. In 1954, uh, <clears throat> Albert Einstein wrote a public letter, and I just want to quote one sentence from this letter. He wrote, I would rather choose to be a plumber or a peddler in the hope to find that modest degree of independence still available under present circumstances. The circumstances were the McCarthy years in the US, and this was Einstein's response to them. And just as a <clears throat> footnote, after this letter was published, the president of the Plumbers Union of New York City wrote to Einstein, I'm a fan of you, Professor Einstein, and I would like to offer you to become an honorary member in the Plumbers Union. <laughs> so science needs allies, and it's a reminder that science thrives in democracies, something that we very often take for granted but this is a strong reminder. So for the sake of simplicity and briefness, I want to speak about three arguments, three sites, three routes where the resilience of science resides. The first one, and perhaps the most important one, is science works. This is perhaps the greatest achievement of science at all, it's the passion, the curiosity, the perseverance, the organized skepticism, the hard work of exploring how the natural and the social world work. And in order <clears throat> to be sure to make it work, <clears throat> we rely on something that all of you are involved here, what we call peer review, as a way <clears throat> of validating, of making experiments repeatable, of certifying the knowledge that comes out of the scientific work that works. And as we also know, this peer review system is under stress. It's a question of size, of uh, the <clears throat> questions of research integrity, but it's also a question of irrelevance that people like Ioannidis have pointed out for the biomedical science, how many papers are being published without being really relevant and leading to solution. And yet, I say this is where the resilience of science lies. Can the system be reformed? Yes. Will it be reformed? I hope so. But my greatest worry is about that part of the system that concerns the young generation. And the young generation, as I see it, is under pressure that previous generations have not been under. They are asked to do many more things than just doing science. They have to communicate, they have to become innovators, they have to set up startups, and so on, and so on. And they are under increasing time pressure. The temporal grid under which young scientists work has become tighter and tighter. And the feeling of acceleration is really the result of clashes of different temporal regimes. If you work on an experiment, your model organism does not always comply with the deadlines that a recruitment committee or promotion committee has set for your work to be assessed. And if you have deadlines because you reach the age of 30 or 32, again, it puts an enormous temporal stress on young people. And they are also asked uh, to play the indicator game, as I call it. 
We all know how much indicators are now part of the promotion system of science and what the indicator game does for young people and they learn how to play the game is indeed it makes them look at the outcome that is good for their promotion but science will suffer. So I think resilience is also something that is being tested all the time. It is tested by change in circumstances and therefore I hope that we will have this resilience of science also in the future by making young people resilient and making the system such that we have resilient young uh, researchers. Resilience number two, and I will be somewhat briefer on that, resilience number two is what I call the very strong and deeply founded belief in what Abram Flexner in 1939 called the uselessness of, uh, the, the usefulness of useless knowledge. This is the title of the manifesto that he wrote. It has been republished um, in, in this year by the Institute of Advanced uh, Study in Princeton. And this manifesto led to the setting up of the Institute of Advanced Princeton, of uh, um, Princeton Advanced Institute. And the useless, seemingly useless knowledge, as we all know, has found a very productive home in Princeton. It was the place where John von Neumann, Turing and others laid the foundations for computerization, for digitalization. It was the home for Einstein and ma many other refugee scholars from Europe. So it became an enormously productive place. And this belief in the scientific autonomy and scientific mobility is something that is deeply rooted and in my view, one of the main courses uh, from which the resilience of science springs. But again, it's being tested, it's being perturbed by present day circumstances. And we see again and again that politicians are calling for short term impact and they tend to marginalize the importance of the seeming useless knowledge. And <clears throat> even if we have 400 years of history of science with the amazing achievements on our side, the short-term impact imperative uh, addresses this and tests uh, the resilience again and again. But in order to prepare, and this is what resilience is also about, to prepare for unexpected future perturbances, it is perhaps important to update Abram Flexner. We all believe in the usefulness of useless knowledge, but we know relatively little, we speak relatively little about the processes, the exact processes through which seemingly useless knowledge becomes useful. This holds true also for innovation. We know relatively little how innovation actually works. We can see it after it has worked. And <clears throat> this um, also raises the important question, what is usefulness? What is useful? Who defines it? And useful for whom? So in order to strengthen this very strong resilience here in the future, <clears throat> I think it merits further reflection and discussion. And the last resilience three, <clears throat> and Enric mentioned my book, The Cunning of Uncertainty, where I uh, spoke about it at length, has to do the resilience of science in being able not only to cope, but being able to navigate uncertainty in a splendid way. Science thrives on the cusp of uncertainty because it means moving into the area of unknown knowledge. It is an incentive to move forward into what is not yet known. And all scientists know that in the end, all certain knowledge is preliminary knowledge that will be replaced or expanded by other knowledge. And this contrasts very sharply, and this is something that I've learned during my years at uh, the ERC as well. This, um, 
way of being able to cope and navigate uncertainty contrasts very sharply with the way how society and politicians deal with uncertainty. There's a craving of certainty in society. Politicians want to know from scientists, is this stuff cancerous, yes or no? They want to have answers to yes or no questions, where anything that a scientist can respond is yes under the conditions of, and then comes a long list, or no under the conditions that. And I think in order to strengthen this re resilience, we have to convey to society and to politicians that there are probabilities, that there is randomness, and there is no absolute certainty. There's also <clears throat> serendipity, which is a very powerful ally of science, as we know, and it helps scientists. And to convey some of this to society um, still needs further work. So, to come to the end, probably there will be more perturbations ahead for science everywhere. And therefore, we will do well to think about resilience, what are our sources of strength, but also to think further what we can do to make resilience even stronger. Thank you very much. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, and colleagues, it's an honor and privilege to have been asked to deliver this laureation address for Professor Kuhn Lennertz, the President of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And it's a special pleasure for me, uh, for the reason already mentioned by, uh, by President Gunter Stock, that we were sworn in together as judges of the new court of first instance, now the General Court of the European Union. I was one of the older judges. Kuhn was by some distance the youngest, having been appointed at the age of 34. And he says that I used to refer affectionately to his cabinet as the baby cabinet. Already at that stage, however, it was clear to us that we had amongst us one of the outstanding exponents of European law and a powerful judicial intellect. So let me very briefly trace his stellar academic history. He graduated summa cum laude at the universities of Namur and Leuven and from there he went to Harvard, where he graduated with master's degrees in law and public administration. After Harvard, he returned, as Professor Stock has said, to the University of Leuven, where he completed his doctorate and was awarded the prize of the Royal Belgian Academy of Sciences. He was almost at once appointed a professor of European law at the University of Leuven. And he has held that position ever since, still taking time to engage with the students. He's held many visiting professorships at universities in Europe and America, and he served on the governing and advisory boards of many universities, institutes, and learned journals. He has been a member of Academia Europea since 1988. The number of his publications and public lectures is beyond my powers of computation. But his principal activity for the last 28 years has been as a judge of the European Courts in Luxembourg. 14 years as a judge of the Court of First Instance, and a further 14 years as a judge of the European Court of Justice. 
He was vice president of that court for three years, and to no one's surprise, he was elected president in 2015. So those are his public distinctions, both academic and judicial. And these alone would justify his recognition here. But there are other and perhaps more important reasons why he should be awarded the Madame de Staal Prize for cultural values. Madame de Staal holds a special position in the history and ideas of European Romanticism, but also in the idea of constitutionalism. The idea that the authority of government is derived from and limited by a body of fundamental law. And that principle of constitutionalism, of government limited by a body of fundamental law, is central to the very existence of the European Union. Without it, the Union would be no more than an assemblage of states. Kuhn Lennart, both in his writings, his public lectures, and especially in his judicial work, has been one of the foremost exponents of the principle of constitutionalism in practice. He brings the doctrines of the classroom and the world of academia to bear on the day-to-day -day work of the courts. And not only does he do that, but he explains why that should be so. We started together as judges in Luxembourg just before the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Treaty of Maastricht. At that time, Europe was full of light and optimism and Francis Fukuyama predicted the end of history. Since then, alas, we have had too much history. Our core values are under threat and we depend even more now on those like Kuhn Lennart who keep alive the flame of constitutional lawfulness. But I can't end without saying something more personal about Kuhn Lennart. He and his lovely wife, Chris, have six beautiful daughters, all showing every sign of the inherited genes, both in appearance and in brain power. To everyone he meets, and particularly students and younger colleagues in the academic and legal world, Kuhn is, as one of them said, warm and curious, warm in his personal relations without any distinction of status, and curious to know about others, what they're doing, and to hear about their ideas. When asked as to his hopes for his legacy as president of the court, he summed it up in one word, quality. So I ask you to confer the Madame de Staal Prize on a man of very special quality, Kuhn Lennart. If you like, I can read what was written here. 2017, all European academies, Madame de Staël Prize for Cultural Values of the European Federation of Academies of Science and Humanities, co-sponsored by Compagnia di Sao Paulo, is awarded to Professor Kuhn Lennartz in the city of Budapest on 4th of September 2017. President of Alia, congratulations. <laughs> This is paper. The more material things come later. Thank you very much. <laughs> Presidents, 
Ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored and indeed humbled to be here today to accept this Madame de Stael Prize for cultural values. I'm conscious that in doing so, I'm following in the footsteps of some very distinguished people and I'm extremely grateful to the all European academies, both for the award itself and for the opportunity that I have to address you here today. Special thanks to Sir David. I was going a long way together with Sir David. I learned a lot of him and it is really moving to hear him speak from the heart, expressing also his attachment to the cultural values for which Madame de Stael stands. Thank you so much, David. Germain de Stael, who lived indeed, as has already been alluded to, from 1766 to 1817, she lived in an age when the old established political and social order was under threat from new ideas and European society was in a state of enormous flux. In the early 21st century, we too live in an increasingly complex and fast changing world. The European Union, as we all know, faces serious threats. Terrorism and the mass migration of people fleeing conflict and oppression, and oppression, to name just those two. Our cultural values are also being tested in other ways, not least the right to freedom from discrimination in the expression of one's religious beliefs, an issue which some seek to portray as a clash of civilizations between Western democracies and their Muslim minority populations. Each of these societal challenges has found its way into the docket of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And I propose, combining my academic and my judicial interest, to touch briefly on several recent cases that are relevant to those issues. I would like to begin with two rulings from this year, March, concerning freedom from discrimination in respect of one's religious beliefs, in which the Court of Justice was required to balance that right against the wish of an employer to forbid the wearing of religious symbols in the workplace. In those two cases, which were similar in many respects, yet subtly different, like it often goes in the law, the Court of Justice was asked to rule on the legality of the dismissal of two Muslim women, one Belgian, one French, because of their insistence on wearing an Islamic headscarf at work. In the Belgian case, the woman's employer imposed a generally applicable prohibition on the wearing by employees of any visible signs of political, philosophical, or religious beliefs. The employee at stake, a receptionist, made clear that she would continue to wear a headscarf and was dismissed. She challenged her dismissal before the Belgian courts on grounds of discrimination and the reference was made to the Court of Justice. For the non-lawyers in the room, you should know that the non-discrimination principle on grounds of religion is um, let down in Article 21 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union and further concretized in Directive 2000-78 on non-discrimination, among other things, on grounds of religion in the workplace. So this is European Union law, and hence to be interpreted in a uniform fashion 
by our court. The court ruled that the prohibition on wearing an Islamic headscarves, which arises from an internal rule of a private undertaking, such as the one at issue, that means a general neutrality rule, does not constitute direct discrimination based on religion or belief under EU law. Effectively, all signs of opinions, whatever they be, are being prohibited. Nevertheless, such a prohibition may constitute indirect discrimination if it is established that the apparently neutral obligation it imposes results in fact in persons of a particular religion being put at a disadvantage. Such indirect discrimination may, however, be objectively justified by a legitimate aim, such as the pursuit by the employer in its relation with its customers of a policy of neutrality, provided that the means of achieving that aim are appropriate and necessary. So the court, in fact, held that balancing the freedom of enterprise, the freedom to engage in a trade, on the one hand, Article 16 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and the uh, freedom to express one's religion, Article 21 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, had to be balanced in that the employer's right prevails in assigning a neutrality uh, to his undertaking vis-a-vis -vis the customers, but for all employment inside the business, without this external contact, the religious expression prevailed. So that is the balancing which we had to do between um, the neutrality rule imposed by the employer and the right of the employee to uh, express uh, her uh, religious beliefs through the wearing of a headscarf. In the parallel French case, the woman concerned, a design engineer, was dismissed following a complaint from a customer to whom she had been assigned. The employer reaffirmed the principle that it was necessary to dress neutrally when meeting customers and asked the employee not to wear a headscarf in the future, but she refused and was dismissed. The employee challenged her dismissal before the French court and a reference was made to the court of justice. However, the case is different from the Belgian case because it was not at all clear that the French employer had actually adopted a neutrality rule that is a prohibition to express any political, trade unionist, sports, religious or other beliefs externally. Rather, it looked like the French employer had just said to that particular employee there is a customer who complains, therefore take off the headscarf, and if you don't, you're being fired. Here the court accepted that direct discrimination was um, in place. And therefore, for direct discrimination, under the directive, it can only be justified when the um, rule has uh, a is a, is a genuine and a determining occupational uh, requirement. The example being, there are medical doctors in the room. If you are a surgeon uh, in the operation room, you may well have to wear a particular dress for reasons of, um, of health care. And of course, this may involve that you don't wear the headscarf. That is a totally neutral rule, which is a genuine and determining occupational requirement. But the court said that clearly is not here the case. There is no genuine and determining occupational requirement for this design engineer uh, not to wear the headscarf. It was only a, a customer of that firm uh, saying, well, I'm not liking this headscarf. Therefore, next time, no headscarf anymore. And there the court said, no, if there is a general neutrality policy which is justified, it can work. If this is sort of an a la carte um, exclusion, it cannot work. Now, you may say, say well, what is the, the subtlety of that distinction? You see how lawyers and judges work. It is extremely important 
because if you have a general neutrality rule, it means that the employer treats all religious beliefs, all other beliefs, in a strictly equal fashion. It also means that he has to make an assessment. There are employers who say, no, no, I'm not prohibiting the wearing of religious signs because my customers, being in a particular region, they might rather appreciate. I can give you the example, which is a real example, of a, a supermarket chain, which in my home country, Belgium, allows the wearing of the headscarf in, for, for the personnel in the supermarkets in Brussels, in Antwerp and in Liège, but not in the rural areas of West Flanders. That is what I mean. So it's a balancing matter. It's important to emphasize that such issues of discrimination do not only come before the court in respect of Islamic or Jewish religious practices. In one pending case, the Egenberger case, in which the hearing took place last July before the Grand Chamber of the Court, a real constitutional type of case, a German court is asking the Court of Justice whether a Protestant religious organization or the Protestant church itself may authoritatively determine whether adherence by a job applicant to a specified religion constitutes a genuine, legitimate, and justified occupational requirement having regard to the employer's ethos. The case concerns a job applicant who alleges that she was not considered for appointment by the organization in question of the Protestant Church because of her lack, her admitted lack of Christian faith. Whatever the outcome of that case, the questions raised illustrate an important point. EU anti-discrimination law applies across the board, regardless of the religion or value system concerned. I now move to a second um, set of uh, case law, and that concerns the struggle against terrorism. It also raises difficult societal issues that require us to strike a delicate balance between competing public interests and values. One of our shared European values is that in the absence of evidence giving rise to suspicions that someone has committed or will commit a crime, everyone is free to go about his or her business, saving the knowledge that the privacy of his or her communications will be respected. However, the police and other authorities whose job it is to protect the public are keen to garner as much intelligence as possible, not all of which may turn out to be useful in order to prevent acts of terrorism. It is quite clear that if security is the sole concern, you might have a general surveillance system which comes very close to an absolute police state. On the other hand, privacy and freedom must also suffer some limits in order to have a reasonable degree of security. It's a balancing of freedom privacy against security, a typical constitutional uh, weighing up balancing of competing values, which the constitutional courts in almost all of our member states and also the United States Supreme Court are faced with. Our court delivered first the digital rights case. In that case, the court was called upon to arbitrate between those two competing imperatives. The case concerned the validity of EU rules requiring member states to oblige telecom service providers to record certain data concerning private electronic communications. 
for the purpose of investigating serious crimes, including terrorism. In substance, the court ruled that the retention of information concerning the electronic communications of persons generally, regardless of whether they were suspected of any crime, was not proportionate to the objective pursuit, having regard to the right to privacy and the right to the protection of personal data. The court therefore held the relevant EU rules to be invalid. So the legislation of the European Union was squashed because it had not struck the right balance between freedom and security. In December of last year, the court found in the cases Teletu, Sverige and Watson that analogous national rules adopted in Sweden and the United Kingdom respectively were also incompatible with the relevant EU law provisions as interpreted in the light of those same fundamental rights. And I pause here for a second because the Watson case, the British case, originally was the Davies case. And you may know who Mr. Davies is. <laughs> this was a case brought in the High Court of Justice for England and Wales in London to have an act of Westminster Parliament set aside because it conflicted with the European Electronic Communications Directive of 2002, Article 15 of that directive, as interpreted in the light of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So the Court of Appeal, case went to the second level, brought the, that question to our Court of Justice. Now, it was Davies and Watson against the Home Secretary, who at the time was a certain Theresa May. So this was a case Davies against May. And as you know, they're now both members of the UK government. But what is interesting is that the case was clearly brought to our court by a political force which at the same time was claiming that the Court of Justice of the European Union should not rule on the basis of Union law on the acceptability of Westminster Parliament Acts with Union law, because that is undemocratic. It shows you that sometimes there is a rather big ecar distance between what is claimed in a political campaign for a referendum and what at the very time, at that moment, was being done in the docket of our court. It may be interesting to bear that in mind. Be that as it may, these national legislations have to be adapted as well. Now, some doubtless consider those judgments naive and legalistic on the basis that in the current climate, national security must take precedence over all other interests. I can assure you that the Court of Justice is painfully aware of the importance and difficulty of the choices that we are asked to make in such cases. We are, however, judges. And as judges, obliged to apply the law, and that is what we seek to do. And the law is interpreted in line with the common constitutional traditions of the member states. It is the best of the cultural, legal, ethical values of the member states of the European Union, which work through in our case law, and that is what we balance against each other. Moreover, one should never forget if electronic surveillance is allowed in the absence of specific evidence justifying it in a particular case, then in a sense, the terrorists have won by forcing us to change our way of life and to compromise the values on which our European civilization is based. The migration crisis has raised 
complex societal questions for European nations. And in a very recent judgment, the court was called upon to interpret the rules that determine which member state is responsible for handling a migrant's claim for protection in circumstances where that person entered the EU through one member state before traveling to another member state. Given the importance of this case for the EU asylum system, the court made its ruling under the expedited procedure so that the national court waited only a matter of months for the ruling that it needed. The judgment in question concerned two Afghan families who entered Croatia from Serbia in 2016 without an appropriate and required visa. The Croatian authorities organized transport for them to the Croatia-Slovenia border and they subsequently applied for international protection in Austria. Austria considered that since they had entered Croatia illegally, it was for that country to examine those applications and that they should therefore have to return there. In the course of the litigation that followed, an Austrian court referred that issue to the Court of Justice. The Court of Justice ruled that the admission of a third country national to the territory of a member state was not tantamount to the issuing of a visa, even if the admission was explained by exceptional circumstances characterized by a mass influx of displaced people into the EU. Effectively, you remember that in Croatia, also in Hungary, in Bulgaria, in Greece, in Italy, that is the member states of the European Union with outside borders, there was such a human flow, mass flow, that they couldn't physically be stopped without using violence, which would of course be totally in conflict with fundamental rights. So they, like the sea, uh, the waves of the sea, they flooded in and they were waved through, which they call beautifully in German, durchfinken, waved through, to Austria or to Germany, where the authorities had said, well, wir schaffen das, you can come through. And I don't mean this negative, on the contrary. So it was a matter of, you will see it, of going through. And so the question was, if this, is this behavior by these border member states with external borders, is that tantamount or equivalent to a lawful entry as though those people had obtained in advance a visa, because after all, they are admitted by uniformed police people and, and public authorities. They are put on a bus or on a train and, and under guidance of the public authorities, they go to a next member state. Does that amount to lawful entry? The court said, no, it remains unlawful entry. And that's important because it means that the responsibility of principle of the member state of first illegal entry remains, in this case, Croatia. However, the court attached two provisos to this principled responsibility of that first member state which is flooded from the outside. And there again you see how this balancing of constitutional values takes place in our court. First of all, the court points out that member states under the so-called sovereignty clause may of their own willing, unilaterally or on the basis of bilateral or multilateral agreements between member states, share the burden. And it is in that sense that the German via Schaffendas is a very important sign of this first thing. That is basically Germany saying, we are not legally obliged to take these people because they have not entered the European Union through the external border because Germany has none. Aber wir schaffen das. They can come through. Austria has done to some extent the same. 
So the code said that is absolutely in the spirit of solidarity and has to be applauded. That is how Europe should work. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that the protection of the fundamental rights of the asylum seekers requires, more particularly the right to human dignity and to humane treatment, that if the first member state, being for instance a poorer member state, manifestly has not the means, practically speaking, to give what we call in, in, in Dutch, huh? there are some Dutch speakers here, bed, bread, and a bath. That is the basic needs, to ensure these basic needs of the asylum seekers while the application is, is uh, being um, processed, then you can't send them back. Because then, if Germany or Austria were to send them back to that third member state, it would, of course, breach human dignity, and that is not possible. So, the court upheld the system of the responsibility of the first of the state of member state of first entry, but with two corrections based on the constitutional values underpinning the European Union as a whole. The court, of, of course, remains a court. That is, we cannot rewrite the legislation. So we start from the legislation, which is the outcome of a democratic process at EU level. Qualified majority in the council, ministers expressing the view of their member state, but backed by their national parliaments, before which they are uh, held accountable. And in parallel, the European parliament directly elected, which is also uh, needing a parliamentary majority to adopt the legislation. So the court upholds the legislation, but interprets it in compliance with the basic constitutional uh, values. That is, as a matter of, of policy, extremely important that there is a division of roles between the legislator and the court. A second comment in this regard is that the court does not make its rulings in a vacuum. So when applying the rules adopted by the legislator, the court must always ensure that due attention is paid to the fundamental values recognized in the EU legal order. And that is also what Sir David referred to, the democratic process, be it in nation states, member states of the European Union, or in the European Union itself, the democratic process is always bound to fundamental values which rest on a societal consensus expressed in the Constitution, and that, of course, for the European Union uh, are the treaties on which the European Union is based, as well as the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. As the cases that I have mentioned illustrate, in situations where complex societal problems threaten the rights of individuals, the Court of Justice has a vital role to play in ensuring that those rights are respected, particularly in situations where individuals are in a position of relative weakness, as will often be the case in their dealings with public authorities or big commercial organizations. Think about our Google and Facebook cases, for instance. That said, that said such problems cannot be solved by judges alone. And the search for appropriate policy solutions must involve close cooperation among those who work in a wide range of disciplines that are covered by the All European Academy's activities. Academics and others who are involved in the historical, social, political science and economic fields, as well as those of us in the legal world, must all play our part in that search, that search for the common values by pooling our skills, our imagination and our intellectual resources. Only in that way we can hope to develop ideas that will actually work in practice and which will pay due heed 
to the basic European values that we share and in which Madame de Stael believed. It is for this reason that the price which is given to me will not go to my personal possessions. I have decided, together with my wife, Chris, to donate this prize to Leuven University in order for them, together with the other funding from the university, to set up a fund to promote research and also teaching materials in order to spread the all European cultural values which are the basis of the European Union. The European Union is not something outside, above, besides, or under, or whatever, our own identities. The European Union is integrated into each one of us, our national identities. When I'm here in Hungary, the European Union is Hungarian. The European Union is a dimension of being Hungarian because Hungary is connected with open borders to its neighbors, connected with open borders to its neighbors and so on. We live in a single space, interdependent, with a common destiny based on common values. And I can say the same when I'm a Flemish or a Dutch or a German or a French or a Portuguese. The union is part. It's something which all these states and peoples have in common. It's an additional tool to behave with respect and in solidarity for each one's identity and to do things together with added value for all of us. That's the European Union, and it should be integrated in school teachings from primary school onwards, primary school, secondary school. So the fund of Leuven University started with the uh, amount of this price will serve to develop through research and teaching skills the materials needed to bring the EU dimension based on the common cultural values for which Madame de Stael stood, to bring that to pupils from a young age onward so that they see their national identity not as something exclusive of others, but inclusive of all of us based on common values. Thank you very much.